Hi, welcome to the Overy is Anonymous Wednesday, the 16th of December, 100 Pounders meeting. Today, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Laurie C, and he will be speaking to us for 20 minutes or more. Take it away, Laurie. Well, I'm, uh, hi, I'm Laurie. I'm a compulsive overeater. Uh, I first said those words on February the 11th, 1986. So that's quite some time ago. And uh, I, I'm overwhelmed by the size of this meeting and by its global scope, the people from all over. I'm also very mindful that there are newcomers here and they are the people to whom I, I really want to address whenever I can. I, I want to give a message of uh, despair and hope because that's step one and step two, and uh, uh, hope through the steps, uh, which is steps three through 12. Um, I, I told uh, Rita before, you know, when she asked me to come that I have not lost 100 pounds. Um, I don't know how much I've lost, but it's, it's under 90, and it's probably in the 70 to 90 range. Um, but she said that I can still speak, so I will. Um, in, I, I grew up fat. Uh, there was a picture of me when I was four years old where I wasn't, but fat all my life. Um, I'm one of those people who uh, led a, a, it wasn't a difficult life, although I found it difficult for me uh, being always fat and always feeling out, out of it, always concentrating on food. Sometimes people asking me how I could possibly eat as much as I was eating. Uh, I joined OA uh, after having tried uh, three different times a, a weigh and pay uh, plan where I reached my goal weight. They told me I could now eat everything I wanted in moderation. And every time I did that, I ended up going back and weighing even more. I went to a therapist. Uh, I decided that my real problem was I was a workaholic. I left my job. I uh, found a, uh, a, a way of working that would allow me to run to work, shower at, wor at the work I had, run back home. That would solve all my problems. And um, by the time three or four months of that had passed, I had never showered, never run to work, never showered in that place and had gained even more weight. And I don't know how much it was. Uh, I, you know, I was a uh, 44 tight waist and uh, a 2XL shirt. Now I am between a medium and a large, well, large to medium shirt and a 36 uh, waist. So I've, and, and I was fat all over. I didn't have a beer belly. I was, I've even lost about a, a, half, an, a, a half a shoe size. Uh, so I was fat all over, but it wasn't quite a hundred pounds. I was saved from a hundred or 250 pound by an alcoholic uh, AA friend of mine. He had been like an older brother to me. He had left uh, my hometown of Winnipeg, Canada uh, about 10 years earlier and occasionally visited. But he had introduced me to the gutter drunk AAers, the people who were absolutely in the, in the gutter on the main street of my hometown and lifted up by the AAers who then took them to Alcoholics Anonymous. They, they sobered up, they went through the steps and they became amazing people, uh, professionals with people who had grade eight education suddenly got their PhD, not suddenly, but got their PhDs. They were successful. They were, but more important to me when I met them, they were people who had something truly in their eyes, a, a depth of, of knowledge and understanding that was really quite overwhelming. I wanted what they had. I, I knew that there was something missing in my life that they had, but my problem was that I don't drink that much and I don't even like the effect of alcohol on me. I love the taste of wine and certain wines and certain beers, don't like liquor at all, but I, I, at that time I couldn't drink more than a glass and a half of, of a beer before my body would reject it and just say, you can't have any more, as good as it tastes, you can't have it. So I didn't, I knew I wasn't an alcoholic. Um, so I, I went, uh, I, my friend came to town and he came to visit me. And my wife, who is not an enabler, was saying, you've got to go back to that way and play plan. You've got to go back. You've got to do some about your weight. I don't want our young children to watch you die. And I have in my family diabetes, 
up the wazoo. I mean, I have so much diabetes and all three out of four of my grandparents, my mother, uh, two, or, two of my grandparents and, and my mother both died of, of uh, illnesses relating to diabetes. And that's what was awaiting me. Uh, I also have uh, high blood pressure and heart disease in my family as well. So I knew that it was a matter of time before my weight uh, would be getting even more and I would suffer from these deadly diseases. And my wife knew that. So into my life comes my friend from out of town and, and uh, I tell him, ah, I got to go back to this way and wait plan. And he says, um, why don't you try OA? I said, what's OA? He said, it's Overeaters Anonymous. I says, what's Overeaters Anonymous? He said, it's just like Alcoholics Anonymous, except it's for, it's for uh, compulsive eaters. And I know some of you heard me say this, but I said, in my life, have I ever had the meeting scheduled for a Thursday, eaten a donut on a Wednesday, and woke up in a hotel room on Friday, not knowing where I'd been? Those were the stories that all of his friends had told me. And I thought I was really quite funny. He didn't laugh. He looked at me and he said, if you don't start taking your food as seriously as I take my alcohol, you're going to die. And in his giving me permission to take my food as seriously as his alcohol, I then said, I'm ready to go to Overeaters Anonymous, and I went. And I'll tell my story in, in just a little while, but I just want to come back a bit and talk about how he saved me at least 100 to 200 pounds. Because if he had not, I would have eaten my way in there. It was getting worse and worse because all of my emotional um, excuses for eating had gone. I no longer was overworking. I no longer, I, everything was going well in my life at that particular moment. And yet I was still compulsively eating. Now, this is a deadly disease, the deadly illness. It's not as dramatic except for some people at the extreme end of compulsive eating and compulsive overeating, uh, compulsive undereating and compulsive overeating. The extreme end, Yes, it is possible for them to make mistakes uh, to continue with their addiction and die quickly. Uh, but unlike, but for most of us, even those of us who made two, who weigh, made two or 300 pounds more than they need to or more than their healthy body weight, for most people eating a donut on a Wednesday, eating even an entire cake as I have done in my life, um, will not have us walking into traffic, not knowing where we are and being hit by a car um, or overdosing to the point that we don't wake up. I mean, that's not the kind of dramatic death that's going to happen to us. The death that will happen for all, all of us who are compulsive under eaters or over eaters is a gradual deterioration of our bodies and our minds, strokes are, are extremely possible as well to the point that we become more and more unable to live as normal people or in a normal way or in any way in society. We will become more and more dependent upon people. We will become more and more difficult for people to look at as we get worse in under eating or overeating. They will look at us as tragic people or difficult people. They won't know what to do with us and we will be more isolated. Our deaths are deaths by a thousand cuts. But if we don't start treating our addiction as seriously as the alcoholics and the drug addicts and the gamblers deal with theirs, then we are fooling ourselves uh, and living in a, in a denial world. I'll never forget speaking to a, a man on the phone who told me he weighed uh, 400 pounds. And I wanted to go see him and talk to him, but he didn't want me to see him. So I talked to him. I talked to him for 45 minutes. And at one point I said, well, if you're as, if, uh, um, if, uh, so I, I mentioned how, how fat I used to be and how fat he is. And he said, what makes you think I'm fat? And I said, if you're not 10 feet tall, you're fat. He said, oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm chubby. I'm chunky. I'm portly, but I, I'm not fat. And that denial 
I understood it. I understood looking at the mirror only up to uh, my neck, you know, and sort of elongating my, my neck so that my face appeared thinner. I remember that. I remember sort of hiking up my pants and, you know, uh, making my chest bigger so it wouldn't look as bad. I, I, I remember all that. But that's amazing. Um, and uh, so that's, that's what's so important. Now, I went to my first meeting and I immediately got a sponsor and things went very well for about a year. But I believed then what I was told by all the doctors and nutritionists and diets I had read that my problem was simply compulsive eating and that could be controlled by controlled eating. And I could eat anything I wanted in moderation. This is all the diets I'd been on before. Anything I wanted in moderation. And my weight began to go up and up and up. And then I went through the steps again and went on a diet and my weight went down and then I went up again and then it went down and went up again. For seven years, I recovered and relapsed in this program. Until one day, the shyest person in the room came up to me and said, how are you, Lori? And many people asked me that. And I would say, I'm fine. And they would always say, good, good to hear it. Keep coming back. It works if you work it and bring a lot of love. This woman didn't say that. She said, I said, fine. And she said, I mean, really? And I just, oh, you know, and, and I, I'll never forget that moment. I mean, because she told me she had prayed for two weeks before she did this. But her love for me was to wake me up. You know, her, her compassion for me was tempered with, with her sense of honesty. I was in trouble. It was obvious I was in trouble. What was I going to do about it? Well, I, from that point on, I began to understand a bit more about what my problem really was. I finally accepted what the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous suggests I should, I, I ought to accept. And that is that there is something abnormal about my body. This may not be medically true or chemically true, but it is true in the sense that, that I have an abnormality in that I cannot stop from doing things in the same way that I can't stop my eyes from blinking or my heart from beating or my breath, my breathing from breathing, my lungs from breathing. I can arrest my lungs for a little while, hold my breath. I can hold my eyes open for a little while, but at a certain point, my body takes over and says, you're gonna blink, you're gonna breathe. This was true for me for some foods, some ingredients and some behaviors that once I started indulging in them, I could not stop. And this was my history. I have tons and tons of examples, which I don't have time to give, um, of the, the essence is my hand would bring food to my mouth. Often it was my hand bringing the food. It should have been a fork or a spoon, but often it was just my hand. I'd be bringing the food and I'd be eating it. And my mind would be saying, I've got to stop. I've got to stop. I've got to stop. And this next one will be my last bite. This next one will be my, no, no, the next one will be my last. And it kept going until I ate it all. And this was my life. And I have many individual stories I can tell, some of which are truly disgusting, where I ate in the presence of vomit and I ate things that, that burned my mouth inside, but I couldn't stop eating them. These are examples of abnormalities. Normal people get full. I've never been full. I've been stuffed, but never full. So from my point of view, uh, what I discovered was that I had to accept that there were some things I could not indulge in. And these things were individual. I mean, the group conscience of OA is that each of us has to figure them out. And what someone else can eat, I can't. And what I can eat, someone else can't eat. And anyone who tries to tell you that you ought to adopt uh, their plan of eating, their particular plan of eating is going against the group conscience of Overeaters Anonymous. Uh, but I, for the, I, I finally decide, realized what I could not eat, what I could not indulge in, and I abstained from it. And then I did the steps. Now, why did I do the steps? Because my real problem, once I know that I can't indulge in certain things, 
it should be any sane person would know you just don't indulge in them. If, if I'm allergic to shrimp or peanuts and I would get an anaphylactic shock and I would die as a result of eating shrimp or peanuts, I wouldn't eat shrimp or peanuts. I'd say I had a good run, but why would I eat the things that are going to kill me? My real problem was in my mind. My mind kept giving me permission to return to that which I knew deep in my heart I could not indulge in. That's the real problem. And my mind would give me a reason and it didn't matter what that reason was. It could be you're depressed, terrible things are going on in your life, you're lonely, you're in love and be loved, um, you're very happy, you should celebrate, uh, or it's healthy, it's organic, so you know molasses has to be much better for you than sugar, or uh, you know uh, the butter comes from free range uh, cows that were coddled in their infancy, or, you know, or I don't know what, you know, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter. You're standing up. It doesn't count. You've been good for a week. You've been good for an hour. You were good for five minutes ago when you said no to the bun so you can eat the cake now. You know, it doesn't matter. Your mind will find a reason that makes sense at that moment. What I have discovered is that the steps clear the mind. That's the promise of the steps. You know, you start off, uh, step two says, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. The sanity is what I was looking for. I was looking for the ability to be around all the things that used to tempt me and not want them. And the guarantee of this program, step nine, that'll happen. By the time you finish step nine, that will happen. And that is exactly what happened to me. Once I eliminated the foods, eliminated the ingredients and eliminated the eating behaviors that I knew caused me to eat compulsively and then work the steps. By the time I finished step nine, I could be around anything that used to tempt me and be happy for the people who express their enjoyment of it and not feel jealous or bad about what they were, about what they were having. Um, I didn't have, I, I, I'm a, a, an atheistical agnostic or an agnostic coal atheist. Uh, so, but I still didn't have trouble with the program. The program is open to anyone. And if uh, my email is in the chat room, uh, anyone wants to talk to me about that. I have particular experience in that. I'd be happy to discuss that with anyone who has difficulty with the, the God thing. I, I, don't, I don't have that, that difficulty, even though I haven't changed my belief or lack of belief uh, all, all these years. Um, so the steps do this for you and they have done it for millions and millions of people with dozens and dozens of addictions. I'm just looking at my time and I, I don't know how much time I have left. You, you've done 18 minutes. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Thanks. And, and what the steps do in clearing the mind is basically they, they, they expose the fact that we live in the past resenting the past and fearing the future. And we don't know how to live in the present because, and, and so our minds are so befuddled by what is going on in our lives, what has gone in our lives, what will go on in our lives, that we cannot remember at the moment, oh, this is something I can't eat. And the steps get rid of that. And it's, it's magical, but it's, it's actually very practical. By just facing our past, cleaning up our past, and dealing with our fears, we find a way of living in the present. And the present moment is, you can't have that. It's not good for you. It will kill you. So it requires the despair of knowing that you can't lick it on your own. And why, why can't you lick it on? Because once you start, you can't stop. That's the body talking. And you can't stop from starting. That's the mind talking, the befuddled mind. So you're in a vicious circle. You can't stop once you've started. You can't stop from starting. There's no hope for you. That is the essence of step one. What's called the double whammy in, a, in, in AA circles. And then the essence of step two is hope. If others have done it, so can you. If others have uh, you know, uh, dealt with their eating issues, if others have dealt with their heroin issues, if others have dealt with their alcohol issues, you can deal with yours. And let me tell you, as someone who has not lost that, uh, the amount of weight that some of you may have to lose, 
I know dozens and dozens and dozens of people in Overeaters Anonymous who have lost hundreds of pounds and kept it off for decades and who have got that same miracle. I also know people who have weighed 40, uh, not, not 40, but 70 pounds and have reached a healthy body weight and have kept at a healthy body weight for decades. This, it doesn't matter how much you weigh or how little you weigh, what matters is you identify with this concept of not being able to stop indulging in an eating behavior or a food or a combination of foods or a combination of ingredients or a combination of eating behaviors. And stopping that and then working the steps as quickly as you can. So you get past step nine, you've recovered. Now you have to live in steps 10, 11, and 12. And I think that's about all the time I have. So I want to thank you. But I just want to give you a hope on the corner. And it's there for anyone who identifies with our addiction. Thank you. Laurie, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing your experience, strength and hope. And I just wanted to read something after you spoke. Um, and it was from page 33 in the big book of AA. If we are planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation of any kind, nor any lurking notion that someday we will be immune to alcohol. 